All right, you can turn your Bible to Acts chapter 2. I had two different questions this couple days ago here, and um, within the last couple days, I should say. Both of them are very good, and I thought, you know, I don't have a specific video on that subject per se. I've mentioned it in different studies, but uh, some of these things, these two things we're going to be covering, um, not in one video, but in two videos. These two questions are, are something that you're going to, you know, struggle with maybe when you get first saved and you get some people, particularly of the uh, charismatic type uh, group, Pentecostal, Pentecatholic as they should be called. Um, you're going to get those people kind of coming after you and, and trying to get you messed up with this stuff here. Um, Acts chapter 2. We're going to start out there. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says here, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Real quick here, the day of Pentecost is a yearly feast day for the Jews. So to name your whole denomination Pentecostal um, because of some special thing that happened on Pentecost, well, there are numerous Pentecosts throughout the New Testament. So problem right there, but we'll continue. Verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Notice it's not of fire, but like as of fire. They were similar to fire, but they were not fire. Very important because, again, the charismatic Pentecostal types will uh, quote the scripture that talks about the Holy Ghost, you know, being baptized in the, with the Holy Ghost and with fire, and they say it's the same thing. And those two different fires. The Holy Ghost baptizes you if you're saved. The lost people go down into hell and they're baptized by full immersion in the fires of hell and eventually then in the lake of fire. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. I thought it was tongue. Well, that's right. Actually, tongues and languages are the same thing in your New Testament. See, the Pentecostals, they don't want you to know that. They want you to think that the tongues are some kind of magical thing that happens after you get saved, that you have to seek the Holy Spirit, and later on you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then you get the tongues. Not so. Tongues are languages. So some charismaniac comes along, Pentecostal charismaniac. The charismatic movement is a movement within the Pentecostal system. There are Pentecostals, I realize, that don't call themselves charismatic, um, but there are still some issues. But if somebody comes along and they say, do you have the gift of tongues? You say, absolutely, I'm speaking in tongues right now. What? Yeah, any language is a tongue. They don't quite get it. You can hear my study on the thing of tongues, what are they? And um, I go through the scriptures, every reference to, the, to tongues in the book of Acts, they're always languages and Jews are always present. Those are the sign gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, talking about speaking in tongues, diverse kinds of tongues, which means basically many tongues. Um, those tongues there are known languages. God will give some Christians the ability to learn multiple languages for the purpose of translating the Bible into those different tongues, you know. That's what it's talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. That's why there's interpretation of tongues mentioned. There's no interpretation of tongues in Acts chapter 2. See, the marvelous gift there that was given was that these people were hearing the early Christians here speaking in their own language, wherein they were born. And I would say, it doesn't say this from the text, but probably they didn't even have an accent when they were speaking in these different tongues because it was a Holy Spirit gift. But let's continue, verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And now, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya, Around Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now show me anywhere in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 where the tongues are listed. See? 
comparing 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 to Acts chapter 2 is quite deceitful. And yet that's exactly what the Pentecostals will do. They try to make it the same. And if you say anything against them, then they'll accuse you of blaspheming the Holy Ghost because you've gone against uh, speaking in tongues. But check this out. Verse 12, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. So they were there making fun of these early... Now, I realize that they weren't called Christians until Acts chapter 11. I understand that. And we're going to get into some of that today. But the fact of the matter is they were mocking these early believers. And what does Peter say? Does he go on to say, You blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You know, you're, you're in big trouble. Verse 14, but Peter, standing in, up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Okay? He doesn't tell them that they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't even warn them. He's just like, they're not drunk. You know? So, you know, it's funny because a lot of this this Pentecostal system and, and charismatic movement and everything else, uh, the, the best way to debunk them is just to read the texts that they rely on and look for what they're saying. You know, I, a lot of you have learned this from me, and I learned it from uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman as well as some others. Um, there's a very simple phrase that you need to understand that you need to burn it into your mind and use it on people. Somebody comes along and they say, Hey, I believe such and such. You know what you say? Just three simple words. Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. What you believe had better be in the book here. If it's not in the book, I'm not going to believe it. Show it to me. Show it to me here. Chapter and verse. Simple. It's a simple standard. Very easy to remember. And that's all you got to do with this Pentecostal charismatic movement. Hey, we believe in speaking in tongues. Chapter and verse. Well, it's Acts chapter 2. Okay, and you go down through the thing. Nobody in here is going, oh, you know, where's the interpretation of tongues in there? Where are the unknown tongues of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14? Chapters 12 through 14. Where are they at? They're not unknown. Verses uh, 8 through 11, list them. Then why would you compare this to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14? crooked. That's what it is. But now here's the, here's the question where this comes in at. Okay, This is where another thing where the uh, Pentecostals will try to mess you up. Here we go. Acts chapter 2 look at verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my, of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Now, the sister asked me the question, is a very good question. How does this fit in with the dispensation that we are in, the church age? All right. What is this all about? Is this is this did this happen? Did these events happen? Is that what Peter was saying? This is stuff is happening right now. The answer to that is very simply, no. What's going on? Well, there are numerous transition books in your New Testament, okay? The book of Matthew is transitioning from Old Testament to New Testament. A testament is a force after men are dead. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17, you can read about that. A testament comes in when, the I should say it this way, the New Testament came in with Jesus dying on the cross, not before. Matthew chapter 1 is not the New Testament. You say, well, should we move the, it says the New Testament, should we move that past the four Gospels? No, no, because the book of Matthew chapter 1 through chapter 28, that book there is describing how the New Testament came in. So to say, well, let's just go to when the New Testament actually started with the death of the testator, then we'll start the book of, of the New Testament. Everything else should be in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. I don't agree with that. I had, I've had 
you know, people actually write that to me. Do you think it should be this way? No, no. Your King James Bible is just fine the way it is. Don't need to change anything or mess with anything. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 is the beginning of how the New Testament came in. But it does not come in until Jesus dies on the cross. That's very, very, very important to remember. Extremely important to remember. Because you go back through the first 27 chapters of Matthew, there's all kinds of stuff going on there that's not pointed at you as a Christian. And the best example, of course, is what? Matthew chapter 24. There's not one Christian in Matthew chapter 24. It's for the time of Jacob's trouble. For the Jews. Let them which be in Judea. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Christians are not forced to keep the Sabbath day. Jews are. It's given to the nation of Israel for a sign. You can see my study on the thing of the Sabbath day. Is it biblical? I think it's called. But that's very important. Very, very, very important to remember. Now, what's going on here? Matthew is transitioning from Old Testament to New Testament. Acts is transitioning from Jesus dying on the cross and the gospel still being presented to the Jews as a nation. That's what you see there in Acts chapter 2. The sign gifts are there. They're going to the Jewish synagogue. All these things are going to the Jews. And it's not until later that they start to go to the Gentiles. All right? Acts is a transition book. What's the next transition book? The book of Hebrews. All right? And what's going on there, and, you know, people get into the whole thing. When were different books written? And then you can tell things. I just stick with the Bible. Okay? You can go through all that historical argument stuff and all these other things and extra sources and whatever else, and it can mess you up, quite frankly. Um, when was the book of Hebrews written? When, who was it directly pointed to? Was it pointed to Jews at the time and whatever else? You can get into all those arguments. I just read the text and it says it's clearly being written to Hebrews. Just like James, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greeting. You know, it's written to the twelve tribes. It's written to the Jews. Right? That's transitioning from church age into the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why you see some works, faith and works type of stuff going on there. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 shows that in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. Anybody tells you different, they don't know what they're talking about. All right? I mean, I've covered this thing over and over again. But this is why it's very important to remember this. Acts chapter 2, the early part of the book of Acts, they are not going to Gentiles. All right? Acts chapter 2, there's nothing in here in terms of... Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 is one that a lot of uh, like Pentecostals and a lot of these holiness types, they'll go to Acts 2, 38 as the plan of salvation. It's not the plan of salvation. All right, the plan of our current plan of salvation was revealed to Paul. I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. It's very important to remember that. So what's going on here is you as a Christian today, me as a Christian today, we read the book of Acts understanding what all happened. Right? We're reading the book of Acts looking back to that time period. What's being preached here in Acts chapter 2, they're looking out and saying, we have no idea. I mean, Jesus just you know, went up to heaven there in chapter 1, and he's telling them, you know, just go out and preach the gospel. And they're like, what are, you know, when are you going to be coming back? They're expecting his second coming. See, Jews are still hung up on that. The Jews still think, well, we reject Jesus Christ, and the biggest reason they reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah is because he didn't fulfill all of the Messianic prophecies with his first coming. See, they don't understand that mystery of the church age that's in there. They're, st they're thinking to themselves, well, he should have fulfilled the thing of bringing in the kingdom and ruling from Jerusalem and all these other prophecies that are in the Old Testament. See, the Jews in the first century were doing the same thing. His own apostles, his own disciples there, they were thinking, okay, he came, he died on the cross, we get that, now we understand. Um, so are you going to bring in the kingdom now? And Jesus is like, no, just, you know, go out and preach the gospel, I'll come back when it's the right time. See? So what are they preaching in Acts chapter 2? They're thinking that they're right close to this time of Jacob's trouble. They're thinking it's just going to happen real soon. But here's where it's interesting. Look at uh, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. All right. Now here's where the confusion comes in. Because the Pentecostals will say, see, what Peter is saying here is, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, meaning the speaking in tongues. Uh-uh. Go down through there. 
verse 17, verse 18, verse 19, verse 20. Do you see anything about anybody speaking in tongues? No. And let's actually go back to the passage, Joel chapter 2. Go back to your Old Testament in the minor prophets there towards the end of the Old Testament if you're newly saved. Uh, you, know, you get into some of these minor prophets and it's like you know, kind of hard to remember some of this stuff. Joel chapter 2 right before the book of Amos. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. This is what Peter is referring to when he's preaching there at the, on the day of Pentecost to the Jews. Joel 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Again, is there any mention or reference in here to people speaking in tongues? No. Then what's going on over here in Acts chapter 2? Peter in verse 16 is not referring to the speaking in tongues. He's not saying, okay, here we are, it's the last days, definitely, and this is what you're seeing are the miracles mentioned in, in Joel 2. This is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Uh-uh. What Peter is saying is, I'm going to talk to you about the end times. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. All right. He's not saying, I'm speaking to you about the events of speaking in tongues. He's just simply saying, okay, let me explain Joel 2, because this time period is coming. We don't know when, but it's coming. It could be very, very soon. That's what he's saying. All right? Don't get confused on this thing uh, by the Pentecostals. They'll try to say, you know, this whole thing of the pouring outpouring of the Spirit and everything else, that this was the fulfillment of Joel 2. No, it was not. No, it was definitely not. Peter is saying simply, this thing could be happening. Uh, why? Well, because the gospel is being taken to the Jews. And if they had accepted Jesus as their Messiah, then nationally, if they would have accepted him as a people, things might have been different. All right? That's why you see the gospel being taken first to the Jews. All right? That's very, very important to get. Let's see if I can find this one. Uh, passage here. Uh, okay, Acts chapter 18. Just to kind of show you some of this, how it's transitioning away from the Jews. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So Paul was not a full-time minister for his whole life and retired with an ice big fat pension or something like that. Uh, no. Um, you know, you can be in ministry, you can be paid for that, that's fine, there's nothing wrong, but uh, you should have other skills first. Uh, I did not go into ministry straight out of high school. I worked a lot of different jobs first, and if I ever have to go back and make a living at that stuff, I'm going to go back and make a living at it. In many ways, it was easier <laughs> than being in full-time ministry. But let me continue here, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks... And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. All right? So, and he does this over and over again because he loves the Jews. And you go over to Romans, into the book of Romans, and he's saying, I could wish myself were a curse for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh who are Israelites, you know. He loved the Jewish people. He loved his own people. 
And we as Christians should have that same love for the nation of Israel. You know, this flag here, the, the flag of the city of Jerusalem, the city of the great king, all right? Matthew chapter 5 talks about that. And it's ironic because they have here the uh, lion of the tribe of Judah, which is one of the titles of Jesus Christ. So their own flag is actually prophesying their Messiah, Jesus. And the two olive branches, which are Moses and Elijah, which will be coming in the book of Revelation, uh, it's described. Very interesting. But I've done a study on that too. You can watch the thing about the two flags of Israel. The uh, cursed flag, the Star of David, which is not the Star of David, the hexagram, it's a occult symbol, Masonic occult symbol. And then the actual city of the great king, which this is the flag that's better to fly. If you want to fly a flag that supports uh, the Jewish people, I'm not saying the nation of Israel per se, but the Jewish people themselves, that's the flag you want to fly, not the uh, cursed hexagram one. But uh, go to Ephesians chapter 3. Well, you know what? We'll, because we're going past Romans here, let's, let's go to Romans chapter 16. Who do we read about there in Acts chapter 18 that we, we were just at there? Aquila and Priscilla. Acts chapter 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Interesting place for a church. Salute my well-beloved Apenitus, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Now, I needed to make a statement about that verse, because there is a teaching out there called hyperdispensationalism, of which I get accused of being a hyperdispensationalist, and Dr. Ruckman gets accused of being a hyperdispensationalist, and anybody that makes that claim is a complete fool. Sorry to have to say it that way, but they're a complete fool. They're lying. They're either a liar or a fool. There's no other way to say that. Because a hyperdispensationalist, anybody that calls us hyperdispensationalists, is, they're showing that they don't understand what a hyperdispensationalist is. All right, Cornelius Stamm was a, a famous hyperdispensationalist. There's a bunch of other guys. can't think of their names right now. But these guys come out, and what they teach is that the first church, so to speak, was from the crucifixion until Paul, and then the church of the one body is from Paul till the rapture. They make two different churches. And the people that were saved with Peter and John and the other disciples, those that went to the Jews, they're in that one church. But then Paul and the other, you know, the Christians from Paul on are in the church of the one body. That's what hyperdispensationalism teaches. All right. A hyperdispensationalist makes a difference in the church age. There are two sections, two parts of the church age. I don't teach that. I never have. Ruckman doesn't teach that. He never has. So you see somebody coming out and saying Ruckman is a hyperdispensationalist or Brian Denlinger is a hyperdispensationalist. You're looking at either a liar or a fool. Either they're so completely ignorant up in their head that they don't understand the issue. All right? And it gets very, very, very deep because you've got to go over scripture after scripture. They'll say a hyperdispensationalist is also against baptism. They'll say, baptism, baptism is wrong. Paul never baptized anybody, even though he did. You know, I don't say baptism is, is necessary for salvation, but there's no problem there. Right? It, it, you get really, really, really messed up with this hyper-dispensational stuff, and it gets really deep. And see, a lot of people don't have the brains to get down that deep, so they see somebody who's dispensational, and says the gospel is different in the church age than in the time of Jacob's trouble and into the millennial kingdom. It changes again, which we'll see in the other study. Uh, and they say, well, you're a hyper-dispensationalist. That's not hyper-dispensationalism. You're showing your ignorance when you say that. All right. And I'm going to name a name here, by the way, too. Recently, Jim Beckwith came out. I've promoted his stuff in the past. He's come out and he's called me a hyper-dispensationalist and Ruckman a hyper-dispensationalist and anybody that follows Ruckman. All right. He's wrong. I hope he's just wrong and not a liar. Because liar, being a lying, uh, excuse me, being a liar is a bit more serious than just being wrong and being ignorant of the issue. But here's one of the verses that you go to to disprove hyper dispensationalism. Somebody says there are two different bodies of Christ. Okay? 
Because right there, Romans 16, verse 7, you have people in Christ before Paul. So, yes, early part of the book of Acts, it's transitioning. There you have it. it the gospel is being given to the Jews first before they go to the, the Greeks, to the Gentile people. Uh, that's very true. But that doesn't mean that those people that got saved in Acts 2, it doesn't mean that they were somehow not saved. The, you know, we are today, but they weren't back then, and they're, or they're in a different body. That's heresy. Okay, that's hyper-dispensationalism. And you can get into a whole lot of other little debates and little things. Hyper-dispensationalists, um, another big representative of it on YouTube is Martin Richling. The guy's a wing nut, okay? He, they just go through the Bible and they'll just chop and cut and chop and cut the whole Bible up and they just, they just cut it up into pieces. I mean, there's parts of Romans, you know, that aren't even for us today, according to some of the hyper-dispensationalists. You know, they're cuckoo, all right? And, and again, you know, hey, I'll just, I'll just put it out there. Anybody calls me a hyper-dispensationalist from now on, because I've talked about this in numerous studies, I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. I've been debunking hyper-dispensationalism for a long time. If you call me a hyper-dispensationalist, the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. Okay? Enough of that. But let's see about this thing of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 3. And some of this stuff gets a little bit deep. I understand that. This is not uh, just lightweight, um, whatever, you know, a little fluffy milkshake or something here. I mean, this is some meat stuff. But uh, it's good to have some meat now and then. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. All right. This is talking about when the gospel that we preach today, when did it come in? For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you, word. Let me stop there. Okay, this is not a title. Don't say, the dispensation we are in is the dispensation of the grace of God. No, 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 no. Okay, dispensation simply means, here, uh, this is for you, this is for you. Okay, I'm dispensing things. Here's a notepad, here's a pencil. Okay, that's what it means. So the dispensation of the grace of God, what he's talking about there is God has always dispen dispensed grace to people in any time, any dispensation out there. All right. So get that one down. So somebody again comes along and says, well, we are in the dispensation of the grace of God. No, we're not. Okay. It's, that's an action. It's not a title. All right. If you want to give us a, a name, church age, a lot of people say church age is where we're at right now. And that's somewhat problematic because, you know, uh, the Old Testament there, the, the Jews out in the wilderness, the congregation in the wilderness, they were called a church at one point. There's, you know, a church just means called out assembly. So you can't really title it, you know, but <laughs> it's some of this stuff, you just, you know, you can get really technical. But uh, just stick with the plain meaning here. It says... Verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you can keep on reading there, but the point of the, this whole thing is the, the gospel that we have right now. See, Acts chapter 2 is transitioning, right? You're going from that time of Jesus dying on the cross, the New Testament comes in, and now Jesus doesn't say, I mean, he does say, go out and, and all, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's true. But first, they're going to the Jews, all right? I mean, because they had a pretty good chance there to 
you know, change their minds on uh, the thing of crucifying their Messiah and who Jesus really was. And of course, you did have thousands of Jews getting saved early on. But then the, the hierarchy, the rabbis and the, the uh, Sanhedrin, basically, if you want to say that, I mean, maybe I don't have that term exactly correct, but basically the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the ruling class of the Jews, they started to kind of pull strings. And you see them going out, they're trying to kill Paul all the time. They're, they're beating other Christians, they're putting them into jail and everything else. Um, they stopped the nation of Israel from accepting Jesus as their Messiah. It was the uh, elite, if you will, the um, educated upper class. Those who controlled the synagogues, you know. Um, very interesting because if you ever take time to study church history, you'll see that every time heresy shows up, it's always among the uh, educated. The seminaries, the universities, the colleges, the big church councils, things like that. It's never the simple people that come up with heresy. Interesting. But... Uh, what you have is Acts chapter 2, they're going to the Jews. They're speaking to the Jews. And Peter is saying, look, we don't know. He's writing, not understanding exactly what's going to happen in the future. And he's saying, hey, to the nation of Israel, men and brethren, hey, you know, you can, you, you've, you know, killed your Messiah. And then you go and read in Acts chapter 2, that's exactly what he's preaching to them. And he's saying, you know, you crucified the Lord of glory here. I mean, dumb move. And couple thousand get saved, and then it's like more get saved, and thousands more. There's a lot of them getting saved, those Jews, until the church hierarchy, the, the Jewish hierarchy, I should say, not church. Well, pagans can have churches too, but another story. Uh, but they come in and they say, stop. If you keep you know, preaching this gospel, we're going to kill you, and we're going to imprison you, know, you and, and do all kinds of things like that. And so they kind of stop that nation of Israel from accepting Jesus as their Messiah. All right? So there's a time there where God has some extra grace for the nation of Israel and he gives them another chance. I mean, here you have Jesus. He dies on the cross, comes up from the dead. Who's ever done that? Nobody. And he's out there, you know, he's seen of 500, you know, people and there's eyewitnesses and, and reports of him and everything else. It's a great chance for the nation of Israel to accept him as their Messiah. And if they had done that, then there would probably been the time of Jacob's trouble back then in the first century. And you and I probably wouldn't be saved. All right. It would have been an interesting thing. And of course you say, but, uh, you know, wouldn't have God, God's outside of our time. All right. And again, when you are, uh, I mean, I'll, okay, I'll say it this way. Right now, do we know every single event that's going to take place in the, in the uh, time of Jacob, Jacob's trouble? Do we understand perfectly everything that happens in the book of Revelation? No. Why? We're looking forward to it. All right. Now, when we come down in the millennial kingdom to rule and reign with Christ, if you suffered with him, um, it, when you come down, are you going to be able to understand the events of Revelation? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Well, because we're past those events. You see? We are past the events of Acts chapter 2. But the people at that time were not. So Peter is going, you know, this is this thing, you know, that was spoken by Joel. Hey, we're right here at the end times. If the nation of Israel, a few Jews out there, if you'll accept Jesus as your Messiah, we can get this thing wrapped up. We'll have our king back. You know? I mean, the disciples are just going, hey, our, our Lord, our Savior just ascended up to heaven. In a cloud, we watched him go up. And they're saying, you know, he's going to come back the same way he went up. And they're, they're excited. They're like, he could come back soon. This is great. We'll, we'll have the kingdom and this is wonderful. But they didn't see what was going to happen with the Jews, with the nation of Israel. We can look back now and see it. I hope you can understand that. So when the nation of Israel rejected, the sign gifts go away. And don't even tell me if they don't. All right. I mean, I've debunked that in different studies. The sign gifts stop, and the nation of Israel is blinded, all right, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now the Lord says, okay, he raises up Paul, and he says to Paul, I'm going to reveal to you the mystery of the gospel. And notice there, it says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. 
So, and, and it says there too, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. All right? It wasn't just Paul only that had received the revelation. All right? It's the others too. Peter, John, you know, James, Mark, all those different guys. They get it as well. All right? But it's first revealed to Paul. God chose Paul all right, to reveal this mystery through. Again, another little saying that you're going to hear is they'll say, well, they got saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. Now we look, get saved by looking back to the cross. Absolute total lie. Absolute total lie. The gospel that we have today was a mystery. It was not made known unto the sons of men in ages past. All right? In other ages, I should say it that way. Okay? So, what's the importance of this whole thing? To sum up. Well, the importance of this whole thing is uh, what the Pentecostal Charismatics will do. They will use Acts chapter 2 as their main foundational text to prove their whole system. It's completely faulty, their reasoning. Completely faulty. Uh, Peter, what he's referring to, uh, this is that which was spoken by Joel. He's not saying us speaking in tongues. Because you read in Joel, you read what he says in the next couple of verses, Peter, what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, there's not a mention about speaking in tongues. There's nothing there. And you say, well, yes, but it was the pouring out of the Spirit. That's what it was that he was talking about. Okay, um, well then, did the rest of the things come to pass that Peter talked about in Acts 2 and Joel chapter 2 talks about? The sun and the moon going dark, like it says in Matthew chapter 24? No, no, those things didn't happen. Well, then, did Peter lie? See? <laughs> you know, Peter is just simply saying, what he's saying in Acts chapter 2 is, hey, the end times are right around the corner. We just saw Jesus go up <laughs> not too long ago. We remember it. He could come back. But the nation of Israel has to accept him as their Messiah. The Jews weren't blinded yet. They hadn't rejected Jesus as their Messiah as a nation. They didn't do it yet. And there are still Jews out there today that can get saved. Just because you're Jewish, you could be pure blood Jewish, you don't have to be blinded. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can get saved as a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, Neo-Orthodox, whatever. Whatever persuasion of, of Judaism you believe in, you can get saved. You can put your faith in Jesus Christ. God is not going to block you from doing that. But this fullness of the Gentiles... This time is just about done. Right? God is about done with the Gentile nations. And I'll tell you what, there's some major, major, major prophetic stuff going on. I heard that the, uh, recently that the Sanhedrin in Israel has been reestablished. It's been like a very, very, very long time that this uh, council has not been there. And you know what they're saying? They're saying the Temple Mount belongs to us. And you know what? The Temple Mount belongs to the Jews. You say, well, no, the Muslims have a right to it. The Muslims have no right to put anything, anything in the city of the great king. And my prayer is to God that that stupid mosque of Omar, God drops a bomb on it or an earthquake or something, just opens up the earth and let that thing fall down into hell. I pray the Lord destroys it. I'm not going to go over and do anything violent or anything like that. I don't have the money or the means, so don't get excited. But the fact of the matter is, that thing has no right. They have Muslims do not have any right to the city of the great king. None. That city belongs to the Jews. You say, oh, you mean the black Africans that are America that think that they're Jews? No, the Jews. The people that are there right now, fighting, shedding their blood for that land. They have a right to that land. You say, oh, well, you mean the uh, white, white patriot Americans, you know, headquartered in Arizona or something like that. No, the Jews that are over there. The Jews, that's their land. That's their property. And the Arabic people there, the Palestinians, they're usurpers. They don't belong on that land. Oh, you're defending the, the modern state of Israel and things. No, the modern state of Israel is wicked in many, many ways. But the people that are there deserve to be there. And God has a plan for them. He's brought them back in unbelief. Why? So that they can go through the time of Jacob's trouble. You understand? If he brought some, if he brought them back in belief, why is he going to pour out judgment and wrath on them for seven years? 
the posties don't get that ever figured out. You know, it's all about them. You know, the church has to suffer. Oh, the church must suffer through the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, we need, or the, they say the great tribulation. They, they won't dare call it the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll just say, well, that's maybe at the end or some little part or whatever else. But it's the great tribulation to try his church. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, okay, you bunch of Catholics. You bunch of stinking papists that don't think that the blood of Jesus Christ is enough to cleanse your sins. No, you have to add your sufferings. Mm -hmm. Fools is what they are. And I have a cause for saying fools, by the way, so don't give me any hassle on that. But uh, Acts chapter 2 is transition. It's transitioning. The early believers there are preaching to the nation of Israel. They're saying, hey, look, I mean, the Jews require a sign. The Lord gives them signs, and they go out, they confirm the word with signs following. Hey, nation of Israel, will you accept your Messiah? You just crucified him. Are you going to accept him as the lion of the tribe of Judah? So he can rule from the city of the great king? Actually, this way. Will you accept him? I think it, if it would, had not been for their leaders, the Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, all those guys, if it had not been for them, the Jews might have accepted Jesus. Just like a lot of the uh, Jews on the street today, a lot of them are, are decent people. And I think that they're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But those leaders, oh boy. You say, well, the Rothschilds are Illuminati and, the, and some of these other high-level Jews are are Satan worshipers and high-level Masons. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Well, then we can condemn all Jewish people. No, you can't. No, you can't. Uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. It's like saying all Germans are Nazis or something like this or, or whatever. You, you can't blanket all people because of some bad people at the top that are, that are part of that same nation. It's ridiculous. And again, let me just kick the whole thing of this replacement theology the Jews are actually black people and Indians in America, or the Jews are actually, you know, the, it's actually the white church or something like this. Okay, well, let me just uh, give some advice on that. Um, if that's what you believe, then I would suggest that you go over and you fight for the city. Okay? Go on over there to Jerusalem and fight for that nation because it's your land. Whoever the Jews are, the land of Israel is theirs. And the end time prophecies say that they go back to the land and they fight for the land and God delivers it to them. And the Antichrist fights for that land too. And he tries to take it and he has it for a little while, but then the Lord comes back and puts an end to that. And he says, uh, no, you know what? Uh, this is my city. And his people will rule and reign with him there. The Jewish people, the people that are there right now, those that make it through the time of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These people, I mean, you know, there are some things about this book, brethren, that are very hard to understand. Uh, there's some things that take years and years of study. Um, I mean, that's, that's another one of the beauties of, of being a Bible-believing Christian. It's not like some cheap book, you know, paperback, 25 cent paperback or something that you can read it and just go, ah, oh, it's pretty easy to understand that thing. Okay, done with that. What, what's next? You can read this book, you can read this book and read this book and read it book hundreds of times and you'll still never understand everything in it. Why? Because it's God's book. You understand? For Z? It's God's book. It's not like the other books that the world writes. This book is a supernatural book. It's an amazing book. So, enough said. Acts chapter 2 is a transition time. Uh, they were writing and they were speaking in a time when they did not know whether or not the nation of Israel was going to accept or reject their Messiah. That's why they are saying, Peter is saying, hey, the stuff about the second coming, it's right here. Will you accept Jesus as your Messiah? And some did, but most didn't. And so that second coming of Christ got put off for nearly 2,000 years. But we're getting close. And it's very interesting because the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 11 about the fullness of the Gentiles being come in. And back in the book of Daniel it says, when the transgressors are come to the full, 
Who are the transgressors? Come to the full. The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You understand? God in His love and His mercy is allowing man with his free will to do whatever he wants and to get so wicked and so corrupt that God can say, my judgment's going to fall. Well, that, that's not fair. I gave you time to repent. I gave you space to repent, as the Bible says. I waited. I was long-suffering. I was patient. And you chose to reject me. You mocked me. You laughed at me. You put down my word. God's been called so many names by atheists, been mocked and belittled. The fullness of the Gentiles is just about come in. The transgressors are almost at the full. That final time when God says, that's enough. If you're watching this video, the church is still here. You still have time to get saved. But you're going to gamble, aren't you? Because you don't think that God exists. You can see prophetic things coming to pass. Earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence. People turning away their ears from the truth. Uh, the love of many waxing cold. Iniquity abounding. All these things, time after just... All the prophecies of the New Testament have come to pass and are coming to pass as we speak. But you're just going to gamble a little bit longer. Well, I'm just not ready yet. I just, uh, you know, I'm just not convinced. Well, you know what? Let me read one verse to you here in conclusion if you're out there and you're watching this. You know, I, I'm aware that there are some atheists that watch me. And you understand that I'm not the average uh, Christian. You understand I'm not uh, trying to get you to come to my building someplace to pay off my mortgage and my salary so I can make hundred grand a year and drive around a fancy car. How to have you bow down and worship me or something like that? That's not me. You watch me because there are some things that are very interesting that come out of this channel. And yeah, you make fun of me and stuff like that, but uh, there's something bothering you. A little bit of conscience you have left yet. Let me just give you a little warning. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse ten it says here, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Jesus is the truth. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure. In unrighteousness. That time period's coming very soon. The uh, fullness of the Gentiles, the transgressors are come to the full. You better get saved. I mean, I, I keep saying this. If you don't get saved soon, time's going to be up. Oh, but I need to see proof. You really need to be careful when you say that. God is so rich in mercy and love for you right now as a sinner. He's saying, whosoever will, if you want to get saved, come on, come on, come on, come on. He's gently pleading. He's the lamb that was slain. But when he comes back, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now let me ask you a question, atheist, or other wicked sinner out there that has not gotten saved. And you're wicked. You're a sinner. Don't try to deny it. You are. According to the standards of the book, not my standards, not your standards, especially not, but according to these standards, we're all sinners. That's what qualifies you for salvation. But just listen to me for a minute. Let me ask you a question. Who would you rather meet in the wild? Or what would you rather meet in the wild? I'll say it that way. A lamb or a lion? A lamb that is meek and mild and ready to be slaughtered to clothe you with uh, His righteousness? Yeah. Or would you rather uh, meet a lion that comes back as a king and that's angry 
you better think about that because you're going to want you're going to meet one of the two right now myself and all the other saved brethren out there we're looking forward to meeting the lamb our lord our savior came and he died symbolized as a lamb meek mild that's what he is right now that's why the lord is allowing people to stomp all over him people to mock this blessed book people to put preachers down he's a lamb right now and he's saying come on get saved I died for your sins he's gentle but when the rapture happens and the axe falls the body of Christ leaves now you're gonna be meeting the line you're not gonna joke about him you're not gonna mock the God of this book when his terrible terrible wrath and vengeance falls upon this earth you know I had a guy actually my older brother physical brother uh, not spiritual brother but uh, I actually had him he compared me to a UFC fighter with what I do when I preach the Word of God he's a modern Christian you know you shouldn't judge other people kind of a deal you know and, and he said you just you know it's like you're getting on top of people and just pounding their head in uh, yeah but you see uh, UFC fighters they get stopped the referee comes in and says stop fighting stop fighting stop fighting and they'll push them off they pull them off whatever else they stop the fight who's gonna tell him to stop when the lion returns who's gonna say to him stop 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 you've you've, you've done enough read the book of Revelation one judgment a third of the people are dead in one judgment I'm trying to warn some of you people. If you're an atheist out there, I love you. I really, truly do. <laughs> I mean, I understand. You see the corruption of organized religion. You're going, I don't want to be part of that. I'm not part of it. Bible-believing Christians are not part of it. But for goodness sake, you're going to be facing the lion. If you mess the time here to get saved, put your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't even have to leave your room that you're watching this video in. That's how simple it is to get saved. You know, it's easy to get saved right now. But if you blow it and you miss it, you're going to go into the time period where you're facing his wrath and his judgment. No more Mr. Nice Guy. No more meek, mild lamb that died on the cross to pay for your sins. A vicious lion that comes back and he pounds and he pounds and he rips and shreds seven years of his wrath. The last worldwide judgment was the flood in the days of Noah. Totally changed the whole earth. That was 40 days and 40 nights. A little over a month compared to seven years. And you think you're going to go through that time? That's the proof that you want to see? You better get saved. You really, really, really need to get saved. And I'm not laughing because I'm secretly just laughing about the whole thing because I don't believe it. I believe every, every word in this book. I believe everything I'm saying. The reason I'm laughing is because it's just so pathetic anymore. Why anybody would reject Jesus Christ. I mean, it's getting to the point where I really, honestly, don't have much mercy for people anymore. I love you enough to tell you the truth, but uh, you miss it. If you watch these videos and you don't get saved and you miss the, the rapture, you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> so that is going to be it. I'm going to do the other video next. It's going to be on the 10 virgins of Matthew chapter 25. Who are they? So that is going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching.